God a hand this morning. And just tell him, great this morning. You guys go ahead and be seated. I want to share with you a couple of things. I told you guys, I think it was last week or the week before, just be praying. Um, we are uh, moving deeper and deeper towards our, our goal of, of our new building. And, uh, uh, and the reason we're building, if you don't know that, is not so that we can look at one day and look at from the street and go, look at the big thing we built. Um, that stuff's going to, the Bible tells us that stuff's not going to last forever no matter what we do. Even if Mikey builds it, it's eventually going to fade away. Um, but we want to do that because we want the ability to reach more people with the gospel and do more ministry. And so uh, we're looking uh, like if everything stays on track, it will break ground sometime in November. And it is an exciting thing. And we are pumped about that. As soon as we have more information, we will let you. Chris is pumped. And so, uh, and so we'll, uh, we'll let you guys know as soon as we have more information. Um, also, I um, wanted to tell you, I know you guys may come here at 8 o'clock and you may be like, man, uh, it's, it's actually thinned out and, and, and it is at 8 o'clock uh, and we have some space at the 9.30 and 11, but Pam was absolutely right. I think we, we don't realize sometimes if you're coming early, you've actually created growth in our church. I didn't know or expect it to happen quite so quickly, um, but we've actually had um, an increase of about 25 people a week uh, for the first two weeks um, and you know, that's pretty significant, so thank you for making that happen. Um, you guys are helping that and giving us room to grow. I uh, also wanted to remind you that we have two things that are really cool that are coming up. And one of them is you've got a date night challenge. Now, if, you're, if your husband, ladies, has not done this yet, I want you to look at him right now and say, get on the ball, coward. Uh, and so, uh, I mean, I just want you to get after that dude. He needs to get busy planning that thing uh, for you. And if you do that by October 20th uh, and the ladies send in an email and let us know what creative date uh, he did for you, we're going to get a chance to award uh, at least one, maybe a couple of prizes. And that's going to be a lot of fun. Um, also wanted to share this because we are a missional church. One of the things that we did last year in uh, December was called the Big Give. Um, it's where at the end of the year we came to a, a conclusion where we were going to take a chunk of money from the surplus of everything God had given us because we want to be a missional church. And we, we said, man, we're going to use that for something. And there's every reason in the world for a church like ours uh -huh. about to build to go, oh, let's don't spend money on other things. Right. But that's not us, and that's not how God's blessed us to get where we are. And so we are going to be missional again this Christmas. And so I just want you to know, as you continue to be generous, God is gearing you up for some really cool things. And we are going to be doing the big give again this December. I don't know how much that is yet. Last year we gave away $40,000 in the month of December. I have no idea this year how much that is yet, but I just want you to be praying about that um, because it's going to be exciting to be a part of it. Well, we've been in a series uh, called Playlist, talking about the different songs that play throughout your marriage. And we had power ballads and pop hits. And last week we talked about slow jams and love songs. And this week we're going to talk about another part of that, and that is uh, it's the rap battle. <laughs> Some of you guys are like, I don't like rap music. Yeah, I know. I know. And you end up in that fight anyway, where you're like, blah, 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 and conflict happens. And I have, for the last three weeks, been singing songs to you guys, and I wasn't going to try to get up here and do a rap battle with myself. Uh, and so I just wanted to kind of get you in the mood for this. Uh, we're about to see a generational gap. Some of you guys are about to be lost for the next uh, 70 seconds. Others of you are about to get really excited. Uh, so I just want to show you a clip uh, from my boy uh, Jimmy Fallon and Justin Timberlake doing a little history of rap. Go ahead. I just had to throw some rap music at you guys and I did not want to try to pull that off. 
Well, here's the thing. We get into these challenges. I was, I was reading a blog and there was this young lady, there was a video attached to it, and uh, her and her husband got married on a roller coaster. And so they were literally doing this coaster, going up and down, doing their vows, and she got off, and bless her heart, this was her quote. She goes, now that we've done this, it's all easy after this. <laughs> And I was like, oh, bless your heart, sweetie. If you think a free fall is scary, it's about to get real terrifying for you. Uh, and, and so here's the thing. I, you know, you get to do marriages, you get to do weddings as a pastor, and we've all been to a ton of weddings, and you sit there, and we hear people say, man, um, we're going to say vows like till death do us part, and I don't know about you, and uh, somebody like Kelby, uh, you know, when you've done a wedding, do you go, mm -hmm. do they even understand yep. the words they just said? For better or worse, richer or poor, uh, till death do us part. Do they understand that means dirty dishes and bounce checks and job struggles and time pressure? Let me say this real quick. Cause y'all listen, y'all are my seasoned, mature, uh, you know, people. I want you to talk with me a little bit. So if you hear something this morning, and you're like, mm -hmm, I want you. You can just be like, yes, uh -huh. like say something out loud, okay? And so let me go through those again. Dirty dishes, yes. Bounce yeah. checks yes. and job struggles, time pressure, yes. sickness, yes. UFC versus HGTV, <laughs> receding hairlines, yeah. advancing waistlines, yeah. flabby arm skin, yeah. uh, like, uh, <laughs> family issues, emotions, aging, yeah. and then man, stuff you just can't imagine. You know, we get married and we go, I just want to be there for each other. But what we really mean is I want you to see things my way. And if you would be more like me, and if you would communicate the way that I want to communicate, then our life together will be perfect. Yeah. Amen. <laughs> but that doesn't really happen. And we wind up in conflict. Some of you guys have probably seen this video, but it illustrates the point beautifully. Because men and women communicate so differently. A lot of times, this is what conflict looks like. It's just, there's all this pressure, you know? And sometimes it feels like it's right up on me and I can just feel it, like literally feel it in my head and it's relentless and I don't know if it's gonna stop. I mean, that's the thing that scares me the most is that I don't know if it's ever gonna stop. Yeah. Well, you do have a nail in your head. It is not about the nail. Are you sure? Because, I mean, I'll bet if we got that out of there. Stop would... trying to fix it. No, I'm not trying to fix it. I'm just pointing out that maybe the nail is causing. You always do this. You always try to fix things when what I really need is for you to just listen. No, see, I don't think that is what you need. I think what you need is to get the nail See, out. you're not even listening now. Okay, fine. I will listen. Fine. It's just, sometimes it's like, there's this achy, I don't know what it is. And I'm not sleeping very well at all. And all my sweaters are snagged. I mean, all of them. Yeah, I, that sounds really hard. It is. Thank you. Ow! Oh, come on. Ow. If you would just- Don't! So, yeah. So. Some of our A-type personality guys are like, it is the nail! All right, so I understand. Well, we want to talk a little bit today about conflict, and we see this in Song of Solomon. Song of Solomon is a book in the Bible. It's a part of what uh, type of literature and scripture we've talked about? It is poetry. It's also wisdom. It is our wisdom literature. It helps us understand wisdom. Wisdom in the Bible is defined as understanding the world that we live in and how to navigate it well. And so we are going to look at Song of Solomon because not every moment in the life of these two people illustrated in this book goes perfect. As a matter of fact, we see this in chapter 5, starting at verse 2. And let me say this real quick. I'm going to speak to some very general things that I'll probably say, well, men tend to be, women tend to be. And those are generalizations that are typically true. But I will tell you, some of you in this room, uh, the truth is some of the guys really are more of the girl role when it comes to certain things. And some of the girls sometimes take on the guy role. And so even though this is general, you may have it flipped in your relationship and that's okay. So what I want you to do is I want you to get your elbow ready because when it applies to the spouse that you have, I want you to be like, mm, let's see you. And if you, if you butt elbows, you know that you're both sorry. All right, so here we go. 
So here's what I want. Uh, this starts out, she speaks. It says this in, in chapter 5, verse 2. I slept, but my heart was awake when I heard my lover knocking and calling. So she's not in any big hurry. She's listening there to the poor guy's knocking at the door. She was, but she's tossing and turning. And, and, and we don't know what the conflict is. Maybe, maybe she just snapped about something crazy. Maybe he compared her uh, to her mom. Um, and maybe she slammed the door. Maybe he stormed out. We don't know. But we know it's in the middle of the night. And there's knocking. And it's him. And then it says, open to me. It's him. My treasure, my, uh, listen to this language, open to me, my treasure, my darling, my dove, my perfect one. If you're a guy, what does that encode tell you about him? He's in trouble. He screwed <laughs> up. This guy is in the doghouse. When you've got to give her four compliments back to back, you have messed up. And it says, my head is drenched with dew, my hair with the dampness of the night. It's been a long night for both of them. And he's trying to apologize she ain't ready yet. Mm. Anybody ever been there? Mm -hmm. Yeah, okay. Here's what she says. But I responded, I have taken off my robe. Should I get dressed again? I've washed my feet. Should I get them soiled? In other words, he's knocking at the door. The door is locked. And he's knocking. And she's going, seriously? You want me to get out of bed? She is making excuses for not engaging in the conversation because she's not ready. And that leads us to our first point about conflict. Conflict is inevitable. Yeah. A perfect marriage isn't on the table. It doesn't mean that your marriage is bad. It doesn't mean that you necessarily married the wrong person. Um, you can actually handle conflict in a healthy way, and from it, your intimacy can grow. But here's a couple of things that we need to understand if we're going to focus on this. So the first one is that we're on the same team. If you're married and you're sitting next to your spouse, I want you to look at them right now and say, we're on the same team. Some of you argued on the way here, and you need to, like, you need to hear that right now. Um, here's some things we need to understand if we're going to be on the same team. The first one is don't get defensive. It's so easy to do. Someone gets mad and they spout off, and then what does it make me want to do? I want to spout right back. And that is not going to be helpful. What you need to hear is you need to hear their need, not their insult. And I know that can be hard. You need to hear what is it that they are trying to communicate to me that is their wound, their hurt, or the need that we're trying to address. And listen, this, this stuff applies across the board in conflict, by the way. Yeah. And so if you're not married, this can help you. You need to not get defensive. And I know that's hard because everything worldly in us rises up and go, no, I have the right to avenge myself. And yet the Bible will tell us that vengeance belongs to God. Hmm. And so we need to not get defensive. Not only that, we need to not stonewall. Don't shut down or storm out. Oh, man, it got uncomfortable in here real quick. So, like, some of you guys, like, Chris just walked away from his wife. That was weird. Uh, so, uh, like, don't stonewall, don't storm out. We need to resolve. You need to stay there out of love. Another one, don't criticize. We need to learn new language. Here's what tends to happen in conflict. Well, you should have helped more with the kids, or you should have done the dishes, or yeah, take you out of it and replace it with, I need. And the conversation changes drastically. Instead of, well, you should have helped with the children. It becomes, hey, honey, I really need your help with this. I'm struggling. Do you know what they say? Psychologically speaking, do you know what they say? The fastest way to make a friend in somebody is to ask them for help. Because it immediately puts them in a position of being the one that's valued. They're coming to the rescue. Instead of being attacked, they feel like they have been invited in to rescue you in a moment of need. The fourth one, don't blow up. Boy, I tell you what, we so desperately want to just go, I have a right to my emotions. The Bible says that your heart is deceitful above all things. You may go, but my heart says your heart's a liar. So don't always pay attention to it. Uh, we see this all the time when we're, if we're going to be on the same team, like, so, okay, so Crystal and I, we have one particular place that is the greatest source of our conflict, and that is in the car. Because I drive awesomely, but she doesn't believe me. And so, like, she's going to be the only person that we ever get in a fender bender, her arms are going to be broken 17 places, because every gesture from Crystal is... 
I mean, and she just gets rigid right off the bat. I mean, she's just, and she's going to get, just breaks all up and down her arms just from a bender bender. And, and so we, and she's always grabbing stuff and reaching over and grabbing me and scaring me. I, I swear, it's, I, I, I think that her dream car would be the car like you used to have in driver's ed school where you have your own brake on your side because sometimes she is pounding the floorboard on the other. Like our poor Kia is getting abused. Uh, and so, and that's a lease, honey, stop it. And so like, like, like it's, it's one of those things where you got to go. Now, but here's the deal. I can get so defensive and so desire to blow up and I'll never forget. Like this happened not long ago because we know this is a struggle for us. And we were in the middle of that. I don't even know if she remembers this. We were in the middle of this and I got so defensive and I started to blow up and she started to scratch my back. I leaned forward on the steering wheel a few seconds into our argument and she reached over and scratched my back. Now I'm a little bit like a puppy dog, okay? Like she, I think she knows that, that, yes. yeah, thank you. And like, I'm like, I'm just like, oh, okay. I mean, like, it was incredible. I want to be mad at you and I can't because I want you to keep scratching my back. And so here's the thing. Conflict is a decision that you make. And she was choosing not to engage in conflict. First Peter 3.8 says, be, so it's a choice, be tenderhearted and keep a humble attitude. In other words, what, what he's saying is you can have the heart that says, I choose not to escalate the conflict, but rather to diffuse it. It's a choice. Second thing I want you to hear, leave the rug alone. Some of y'all, you get mad, you lift up a rug, start sweeping stuff under it, and then it starts to stay there for forever. And then one day, you go, oh, my wife never gets mad. My husband never gets mad. And then, like a volcano erupts and consumes a village of people. Like it's just ugly in that moment. Don't sweep stuff under the rug. We see this here in verse 4. It says, my lover tried to unlatch the door, and my heart was thrilled within me. She, she's, she's not in a hurry, but she wants to be pursued. And then she finally comes to this place and says, I jumped up to open the door for my love. And my hands dripped with perfume. My fingers dripped with lovely myrrh. And I pulled back the bolt. I opened to my lover, but he was gone. And my heart sank. And I searched for him, but I could not find him anywhere. I called him. But there was no reply. She went from, do I have to get up and wash my feet and put them on the robe again, to all of a sudden she's dripping with spices. And oh, she's going, I'm ready to let our conflict die down. He was ready a minute ago, but now her emotions have gone down and his have ramped up. He's like, oh, I swept under the rug for a minute, but now we're going to apologize on your time frame? No. And all of a sudden he gets amped up. Guys, we tend to see this a lot in us is that when it doesn't happen on our terms, we distance. Hey, we, uh, guys, we haven't changed much from the time we were little kids. Somebody offends us, well, I'll take my ball and go home. We kind of become very selfish. And instead of infusing peace into our relationship, we, um, we begin to escalate conflict. And we need to go like, I need to be humble enough to go, if, if she's ready to apologize, guess what I need to be ready to do? Let it go. Like, I don't, I've met women, I'm sure you struggle with this at times, but guys, a lot of times women will hold on to stuff for years. We will hold on to stuff for hours and days, and we will boil over it for a long period of time. And we need to learn that lesson from that frozen girl from the Disney movie. Let it go. Just let it go. It's important. In verse 7, she says, the watchman found me. So she's, she's gone out looking for him. The, watch, uh, the night watchmen found me as they made their rounds. They beat and bruised and stripped off my veil, those watchmen on the walls. Now, we need to understand here, this is a metaphor. It's poetry. What she's saying is something different. She's saying, I feel terrible about how this has happened. And if he knew how bad she feels, he would probably be more tenderhearted. But he doesn't. And that leads us to the third thing. And that is, and this is the popular way the young kids say this, all the feels. We've got all these emotions coursing through our, vein, our, our veins and through our brains. And, and when emotion language comes out, it's amazing what happens. See, guys hear emotion language as failure and rejection. Here's what I mean by that. When, when, when Crystal says to me, Jason, you weren't very helpful with the kids yesterday. I hear... 
Okay, now she may say it in an upset way. Here's how I, I interpret that in my brain. Now, I may be the only one in here. Uh, I'm a failure as a husband and a father. I'm a sorry individual. Uh, and I mean, I'm, I'm a, I shouldn't even be a pastor. I shouldn't be leading a job. Like, I just go to the worst possible place that I can go. And then I start to tell her that. Well, I've failed you. I'm sorry that you, I'm sorry for the horrible marriage that you've ended up in with a sorry individual who doesn't even help with certain things. And then I want to fix it. Well, can I, can I fix it? What does she need? Does she need queso? Does she, uh, like, what does she need? And then when I start saying, well, well, I'll do this. And, and what do you need from me? Here's what the, here's the thing. She now hears feeling language and she responds Negatively, This very tends to be the way it happens. So when I start going, well, I should have done this and I could have helped this. Now it's, oh, I get it. So I'm a bad mother. So, so I'm a bad housekeeper. So I'm a, I'm a horrible person. And you have to come in and sweep in and fix everything because you're the hero. And the problem is we're all heal, hearing feelings. I feel rejected. She feels like a failure. So we need to learn some different language. And the nail illustration kind of says it really well. And that's we need to look at each other and start being able to say, I'm sorry you're going through this. Men. And then stop. I'm sorry that you're going through this. Kim's going, you can just start with, I'm sorry. And that's it. All right, so, like, I get it. I'm sorry. And then, here's the next question. Not, let me give you all of the answers because your frail female mind can't comprehend the solution, which is total crap. Because normally they come up with way better solutions than we do, but we suddenly want to fix it all. Instead, guys and ladies, this happens with us too, is to look and go, is there anything I can do to help you? It's such a different thing because in both of those statements, you value the other person. You elevate the other person. You encourage the other person. And all the other feeling language is what interprets in our brains and our deceitful hearts as rejection and failure. And so it's important to understand those things. So she's looking for him. He's not answering her calls. He's not responding to text messages and she starts to reach out to her friends. And that's not necessarily a bad thing as long as they're not bad friends. Because that leads us to a point that's very important. Don't talk bad about your spouse. I cannot tell you anything that irritates me more than standing in a room full of people. And uh, you know how it goes when you go to like somebody's house for a big party or dinner party or whatever. For a time, all the guys go to one place and all the girls go to one place. The guys will go outside and stand by the grill even though there's no fire just because it feels manly. And the ladies all go stand in the kitchen and drink water. Uh, and so like whatever they're, whatever's going on in there and all that's happening in those two locations and we start talking. Well, I cannot, I listen, if I'm ever out there and I'm just going to challenge you as men, if you ever out there and ladies, if you're ever in there and all of a sudden people start going, let me talk about my husband and what's, and I, you need to end that right there. And you need to go, Hey, can I, can I, can we talk for a second? Obviously there's a struggle going on there, but listen, it's not going to get better by dogpiling on your husband, on your wife in public. Let me see if we can help because we want to build that relationship and not tear it down. And that you see that right here. In verse 8 it says, Make this promise, O women of Jerusalem. If you find my lover, tell him that I'm weak with love. So she's not attacking. She's saying, friends, if you see him, tell him that I need him. Tell him that I love him. Verse 9. They say this. They're not confused, by the way. They say, Why is your lover better than all others? O oh, woman of rare beauty, what makes your lover so special that we must promise this? What, she, what they're doing is go, I, hey, let's, let's remind you of why you love this person. Start, tell me something good about them. Tell me why you fell in love with them to begin with. That's what good friends do. They don't accuse. They start asking you to think about your marriage. Think about your relationship. In chapter 6, verse 1, it says this, Where has your lover gone, O woman of rare beauty? Which way did he turn so we can help you find him? Who are the, these ladies right here? I love these ladies. Whose side are they on? The marriage. 
That's right. They're not on her side. They're her friends. But these are good friends. Which means that they're advocating right now for the union. That's a good friend. If you find somebody who just wants to dogpile your marriage with you, run. They're probably experiencing marital struggle and you need to let them find help and you need to find help somewhere else because you need to have somebody in front of you that is going to look at you and go, whoa, 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 whoa. Let me help you fight for your marriage. And that's what these women do and I love it. Because here's the thing and I want you to know this. If you talk to your friends, your heart is either going to be harder or softer for your spouse after you've had that conversation. If it's harder... You've got the wrong friends you're confiding in. You should come away with a softer heart for that spouse because of that conversation. And this leads to reconciliation. She finds him. Chapter 6, verse 3. I am my lover's and my lover is mine. He browses amongst the lilies. So she's found him. And now he's got this point. She was amped up earlier. She's come back down. He was amped up. Now where is he? He has a moment of decision in this conflict where he can let it get escalated. Sometimes, are you going to fight to be right or are you going to fight for the relationship? Sometimes being right will wreck a relationship. I'm not saying you should advocate for being stupid. Don't misunderstand me. But to win an argument doesn't always make a better relationship. Sometimes you need to go, I'm going to put aside the conflict for the sake of the relationship. And so, well, how is he going to respond in chapter, in verse 4 and 5, you see his response. You are beautiful, my darling. Like the lovely city of Tirzah. Yes, as a beautiful, as Jerusalem, as majestic, as an army with billowing banners. Turn your eyes away, for they overpower me. Your hair falls in waves like a flock of goats winding down the slopes of Gilead. Your hair's like goats, baby. (laughs) He's let it go. There's no grudges in this moment. No No one's going back in time to the conflict. They say, no, we want to fight for this. And in that moment, there's no barriers between us. There's no locked doors. No one's run off. No one's emotions have gotten away. There's no barriers. There's no grudge. It just becomes productive. It becomes healthy. So we have a role in our marriage. In Genesis, the Bible said that God, God said it's not good for Adam to be alone. What did Adam need? Adam needed a friend. I told you in week one, that's the, big, that's the way that that word is translated the most often when it looks at marriage in the Old Testament is best friend. You see that echoed in Song of Solomon chapter 5, verse 16. It says, this is my lover, this is my friend. That's what they're looking for. Our role in marriage is really important. Our, our culture is going to tell us some lies. Our culture is going to tell us that marriage is boring. Um, the marriage is enjoyable. And marriage is good. As a matter of fact, I'm going to tell you something that isn't usually reported in statistics. Is that they've begun to prove, not only statistically, but they've begun to prove in counseling and psychology, that the divorce rate amongst those who are in church actively pursuing God together, their divorce rate for those couples is actually reduced by up to 50% as these people are pursuing God together. And life isn't boring. They're having fun. There are jokes that Crystal and I have. We can watch The Office TV show every single night and laugh because we're goofy together. People pass gas in our bedroom. I'm not going to say who it is. It's mainly me. I'm just saying. Like Sometimes it sounds like there's a dead gum brass band in the room in the morning it's like there's trombones and tubas like it's weird but it's just this great moment where we can laugh together we have all these other beautiful moments of laughter our marriage isn't boring sometimes there's conflict but i love being married and we need to our culture says it's boring we need to refute that lie not only that marriage should have fruit Not only does the Bible tell us that we are to bear fruit in terms of children, what it's really saying even more, though, is that our marriage should have life-giving power, that people should see God in our marriage. But I hope that if you're married, you kiss your spouse in front of your kids. Not weirdly, just... Okay? I'm not going to lie. We were were making... I was 
Friday morning, we were making breakfast for a bunch of kids, you know, at our house, and um, our kids were in the kitchen with, with us, and I was making pancakes, and I flipped a pancake, Crystal was behind me, grabbed a spatula, whoosh, I mean, I, mean, I was just, I was like, and Addie saw it, she was like, Daddy, and I'm like, that's right, I love her, number three. <laughs> like, we need to not be afraid to let our kids see that we love our spouse. Now, let me say this, because i got to hurry. We're, we're, we might experience some turbulence here. Um, and I just want you to know if there's a spontaneous loss of cabin pressure, the oxygen mask above will fall from the ceiling. And I want you to put those on. If you need to assist somebody, do it after you put your own mask on. Uh, but in Ephesians chapter 5, verse 21 through 33, I'm not going to read all this. There is a word that gets used here. It's the word submission. It is, one day I'm going to preach a whole message on this because it's the worst interpreted word in Scripture that causes women and men to be at odds with each other. And here's what I, I love is, is God's point to this verse and it says, look, husbands or wives submit to your husbands. But what they don't look at is in Ephesians 5.21, it literally starts the whole section off by saying submit to one another. Submission is both parts, not one part. And so I just want to dig into this. Now, there's a lot of people that struggle with this because they've had a bad marriage or a bad relationship or abuse. And if that's the case, I don't blame you for misinterpreting this. But here's what this text assumes. Paul is looking at this and his assumption going into Ephesians 5 is that he is speaking to a couple that has submitted to the Lordship of Christ and they are healthy and holy. This isn't broken marriage counseling. This is healthy marriage counseling. He is telling that to them. And he uses the word submission. Sin didn't create submission. Sin made the word submission ugly. This is not, submit to me, woman. This is not her looking back and go, I'd submit to me. If you love me like Christ loved the church. And him looking back and go, I'd love you like Christ loved the church. If you didn't wear that, it's not going to happen flannels every single night. Purely hypothetical. I'm just saying, like, that's not what this is. Submission is serving the needs of other people over yourself. Submission does not nullify leadership. Submission defines leadership. It's servanthood. And there is no other kind of leadership but to serve. So what's the husband's role in this passage in marriage? The husband's role is submit to responsibility. Um, when, a, when a football team does really badly at the end of the year, who typically is on the chopping block to get fired? The coach. The coach. He's responsible for the losses. And that's the role of the husband in the marriage. I, I was reading this blog of this, this young man. Uh, it, was, it was written from the, from the dad's perspective. He said, you know, this guy came to me and he asked for my daughter's hand in marriage. And I looked at him and asked him questions. And I said, hey, where are you guys going to live if you get married? He goes, you know what? I'm just trusting that the, that God is going to provide us a home. And he went, okay. So, well, well, you don't have a job right now. What job are you going to have when you guys get married? He goes, I'm just trusting that God's going to provide a job. He goes, well, I also know that you're broke because you guys keep borrowing money from me. Um, where's the money going to come from? And he said, I, I don't know. I'm just trusting that God's going to provide the money. And he went to his wife and, and she said, well, how, how'd it go? And he goes, I had this conversation. And she and he said, how, how, how did he respond? And she goes, I don't know. The dad said, I don't know, but I'm pretty sure he thinks I'm God. <laughs> Some of you guys will get that later. Right, so. Here's what it means to be a provider. It does not mean sole breadwinner. We've somehow translated that in our culture. What it means as provider is that you, you create an environment for your wife and your kids to thrive. You're to be a protector. You're to create an environment of safety. You're to defend your wife and your children. And when spiritual attacks have come against your wife, you Jackie Chan those spiritual attacks. That's what it means. It means that if you're the husband, you're to be the pastor. Which means that you're to provide an environment for spiritual growth for your family. Specifically, your wife. I get guys that come in and go, well, I'm just embarrassed to pray with my wife. Dude, you get naked with her. Get over it. <laughs> the question is, is my wife growing closer to Jesus because of how I serve her and how I submit to her? A wife's role the word submission that's attached to them is the, is the word that is used to describe the Trinity. It is oneness. What it really is saying, submission is not inferiority and it is not subjugation. The role of the woman in marriage is that she honors and affirms her husband and helps lead him 
and helps lead the family with her gifts. It is not the following things. Please hear this. It is not agree with everything he says. He's sometimes a moron. It is not leave your brain at the wedding altar. He needs your input. It is not that you're dependent on your husband for personal spiritual strength. That doesn't mean he shouldn't be helping it, but there is no umbilical cord that goes from you to your husband and then from husband to God. You're responsible for your own spiritual development. But it also doesn't mean suppressing your gifts and strengths. There are women who have incredible gifts to lead, to teach, to organize, to administrate, to be all kinds of incredible things. And being married does not mean limiting the strengths and the gifts that God's given you. What it does look like inside of marriage is that she looks at him and says, I'm here to help you look like Jesus for the good of our marriage, for the good of our family, and for the good of the gospel. Because I know you can't do it alone. She needs to know, men, that you would choose her all over again, every day, after all these years. 75% of men struggle with insecurity, according to the most recent uh, Psychology Today poll. I don't know if you're aware of that. We think of women being insecure. Men are horribly insecure. He needs you to acknowledge little things. It's important. When we reject God's plan, we end up competing instead of completing each other. Satan wants to attack our marriages. He wants to confuse our marriages. He wants to distort the marriage. He wants it to come in where we say, I outrank you, which does nothing but destroys and erodes marriage. Instead, we need to approach it with, I will outserve you, which means that it will build and glorify the marriage. God devised marriage to reflect His saving love for Christ. That's what it's there for. See, a good marriage is a series of deaths. You can either kill each other or you can die for one another. Greatness, according to Scripture, is when I abandon my need for the needs of someone else. And marriage is a picture of that. God moved heaven and earth to be a champion of a cause with you and your needs at the center. That's what marriage is supposed to be. If you want to resolve conflict, carry ministry and mission into your marriage for your spouse, and everything is different. Everybody focuses on the first day of our marriage. I think it's the wrong day to focus on. I think we need to focus on the last day of our marriage. On the very last day, before one of us goes on home, before both of us go on home, the very last day, whatever that looks like, there's going to be a moment where I'm about to hand that spouse back to God. And God's going to look at what I've done with it and say, well done, my good and faithful servant. Or not. We need to live for well done. Let's pray.